Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. So hello and welcome all. Uh, today we have a very special guest among us. We have Ms. Lynn Rustin, who is the Vice President for Nuclear Threat Initiatives Global Nuclear Policy Program, having worked in the White House, the State Department and US Congress. Uh, Ms. Rustin brings a record experience with her government service. As a Senior Director for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation on the White House National Security Council staff, Ms. Rustin has been instrumental in negotiating and ratifying the New START Treaty with Russia. So Ms. Rustin, we are very honored to have you today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sid. It's great to be here. Thank you. So to begin with, uh, let's start with NTI Security Index, a report which uh, NTI publishes every time, time and again. So could you just very briefly tell us about what exactly this uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative Security Index report is about? Absolutely. So this is an index that my colleagues in the Nuclear Materials Security Program put out, uh, I think, about every other year. Uh, and what it is, is it's measuring the safety and security of, of nuclear materials around the world. Um, it started uh, in, I think, 2012, and that you may remember that, or maybe it started earlier, but it started during the Obama administration when President Obama started having the nuclear security summits to um, um, focus leaders' attention on the importance of safeguarding nuclear materials uh, against the risks of diversion and threat and theft, and of course, potential use, for instance, by uh, terrorists or third third party actors. Um, and so, what the report that they've just issued this year found, unfortunately, is that they're they're finding kind of regression in countries around the world in terms of a lack of focus on this as a priority. Um, the the quantities of uh, stockpiles of um, separated plutonium that's used in the civil fuel cycle are rising. Um, there's less uh, attention to insider threat um, and, and just security cultures, and even things that like radioactive sources that are commonly used in peaceful purposes like nuclear medicine, um, that there's, um, there's insufficient, you know, tracking and handling of those, and also not as much uh, substitution of those radioactive sources with other technologies that are available that are not uh, not nuclear. So these are some of the findings in this study. Um, and it's just concerning uh, that the priority of, of countries and leaders on this maybe is not where it should be. Thank you to get uh, to give us a brief discussion about this uh, report. I'll make sure that we add the link of the report uh, in in our description. I have personally gone through the report. It's a very comprehensive and detailed uh, uh, report and highlights some very interesting and important alarming developments. And some of the de developments we are going to talk about during the course of our conversation today. So to get can started- I just, Can I just add that, you know, one of the values of a report like this, of course, isn't just to sort of grade countries, but it's um, it helps to identify gaps and needs where countries on their own can improve their record, or if there's uh, countries or international organizations that, you know, help countries have stronger safety and security cultures and practices. It helps to identify where the greatest needs are. So it's really meant to be a tool to exactly. um, encourage and induce responsible nuclear management. Exactly. And given the track record, I hope and I have very strong faith in the international community that they take a very sincere uh, recognition of this report and perhaps uh, realign themselves with their actions in terms of their, uh, the recommendations offered by these reports. So by this report. So to get started with ma'am, uh, I would really like to talk about the movie, which has been the conversation, which has been a good center of conversation, especially in Washington, DC, the movie Oppenheimer. So it has made a significant impact in the strategic community across the globe. And it highlights a lot of, uh, it, it shows the risk that what nuclear weapons pose today. So to get started with, what are the key takeaways 
from the movie and what are the present day nuclear risks? Why was the movie so important today? Right. Well, first of all, I mean, it really is a fabulous movie. And so if any of you out there haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend that you see it. It's a great movie. Of course, it wasn't, uh, in my view, done to be a specifically an anti-nuclear movie. I mean, it is a movie about the man and the scientist, Robert Oppenheimer. Um, but, but one of the key themes, of course, is um, his struggling with, on the one hand, the incredible scientific accomplishment of having um, you know, led the Manhattan Project and created the bomb and, you know, in his view, helping contribute to the, you know, the defeat of Hitler and the end of World War II, on the one hand, versus understanding the incredible destructive power of this um, bomb that he helped create um, and understanding that that could lead to even more powerful weapons in the future, which it did, and that it was unrealistic to think as some other Americans did that you could ever keep this out of the hands of, you know, the Russians or other um, scientifically advanced countries. And so it was really, you know, grappling with what the implications of, of the nuclear age are. Exactly. I, I completely agree with that. And in, in in a very interesting way, the movie also showed how uh, Robert Oppenheimer was also purged from his position and his security clearance was taken away because his certain disagreements and his certain ideas about establishing an international cooperation framework to reduce the risk, to control uh, arms proliferation, nuclear weapons proliferation. And yeah. Right. Well, and of course, that has to do with an even um, yeah, a, a sorry um, time in our in American history, the McCarthy era, where people were, you know, wrongly accused of and persecuted for, um, sympath, you know, sympathizing with uh, the Russians or communists or for being Jewish. I mean, there was a whole lot of things going on in that era um, that his his particular case got wrapped up on. And you're absolutely right that a, a significant amount of the movie was um, on that point exactly of his un, unfair, someone many would say, you know, persecution and um, sanctioning and loss of security clearance after he had um, done so much for the national security of the United States. Exactly. And the reward was very shocking to, for the audience to watch themselves. So yeah. yes, uh, he did sort of initiate the conversation about arms control and uh, having the international communities to set up a framework. But we see that it was not taken very seriously. His, his views were sidelined, he was sidelined, but eventually there is an international arms control non-proliferation treaty. There are multiple non-proliferation regime. So could you just slightly touch upon what is the history of arms control looking like from where did we start uh, conversations about a non-proliferation regime? And uh, for one factor, Cold War had a very strong role to play in this. But what were the other aspects? How did the international community lay the foundation for a very strong and comprehensive uh, arms control treaty? Well, indeed, um, as Oppenheimer himself predicted and was shown in the movie, um, it did not take long for the Soviet Union to also develop a bomb um, and eventually you know, shortly thereafter, there was essentially a, a nuclear arms race where both um, the United States and the Soviet Union were were building a lot of nuclear weapons. Um, and so, you know, eventually uh, they came to establish a series of uh, agreements, bilateral agreements between the United States and then the Soviet Union to limit, first to limit nuclear weapons and later to reduce them. And also there was a lot of concern about um, how many other countries would, would acquire the nuclear weapon. And so the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was, um, was negotiated. Now by then there were five recognized nuclear powers, um, the United States, Russia, China, France, and the UK. But the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was um, concluded in 1975. And Basically, the, the fundamental bargain in that treaty is that the, uh, the rest of the countries, which are non-nuclear, would commit to not acquiring nuclear weapons. The recognized nuclear weapon states were supposed to, um, they were committed to uh, 
reducing and ultimately eliminating their nuclear arsenals, and they were committed to sharing the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. So nuclear, you know, civil nuclear power, uses of nuclear um, technology and medicine, um, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, sharing that and making that accessible to the non-nuclear weapon states, but with safeguards to make sure that they wouldn't acquire nuclear weapons. Um, yeah, that's, that's but that a, was the beginning. I mean, I'll just say that, you know, there was um, you think now about where we are. On the one hand, we have far fewer nuclear weapons in the world right. between the United States and, and Russia than we did at the whole of, right. height of the Cold War. But we're also at a very um, dangerous moment in terms of a, a potential new arms race with with Russia, with maybe with China. Um, but I was going to say that the other really big impetus to further uh, arms control was actually the Cuban Missile Crisis when the United States and Russia came so close to an exchange of nuclear weapons. And I think that really sobered President um, Kennedy and the Russian president. And that led to a very kind of fruitful period of, of arms control negotiations to the limited text ban treaty later the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, you know, more agreements, um, successive agreements to limit and reduce nuclear weapons. Um, so sometimes out of very bad moments, positive things can happen. And I suppose if one wants to be optimistic, we can hope to get to that kind of point again today after the terrible crisis in, in Ukraine right now. Absolutely. And a very uh, significant portion of our interview is going to revolve around that disc uh, that point that you made towards the end about Russia. So yes, uh, today the situation remains starkly very different. Uh, the end of Cuban, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the end of Cold War uh, sort of made a very positive change in terms of uh, conversations about nuclear weapons. But today, all those changes seem to be challenged and they are definitely triggered by Vladimir Vladimir Putin, the Russian president's uh, constant uh, saber rattling, nuclear saber rattling, his attempt at stepping away from New START agreement, and also uh, he has taken certain actions towards the SIF, towards his nuclear saber rattling. Is he put nuclear uh, warheads in Belarus? So we have seen some significant developments here. The general assessment also remains that. The risk of nuclear uh, nuclear war is not zero, but it's also not very high. So, what exactly is your assessment about the, about Russia at present? Uh, given that the implications of Russia suspending its participation from start start treaty, and I would also like to underscore here, uh, NSA uh, Sullivan. Uh, Jake Sullivan recently at an arms control association annual gathering, he said that he's willing to start negotiations with, uh, with, with Russians without any precondition. Uh, that kind of uh, statement was also welcomed by the Kremlin, but we have not heard anything significant from him and from either side uh, about this. So yes, where do we stand on Russia right now in terms of nuclear risks? Well, I think it really is a dangerous moment. And to, to step back a little, we've really seen over the last decade or so an unraveling of the arms control agreements and security architecture, in particular in the Euro-Atlantic region between the United States and Russia, um, many European countries and Russia, um, that have kept security over the years. And even the, you know, the conventional forces agreement is gone. The um, open so-called open skies treaty um the um inf treaty of course um is now um defunct and 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 then new start is the last remaining strategic arms control agreement and as you noted um in the context of the war in ukraine russia has suspended its participation partially now what that means is they have said, and the United States assesses, that they are still abiding by the numerical limits of the treaty. Um, but what they have refused to do is resume the on-site inspections, which have, they had stopped by mutual agreement because of the pandemic. But then they have um, refused to come back to an inspection regime. And they've also stopped um, exchanging all of the notifications and, and data that is routinely shared in the course of that treaty where whereas 
when which it's is very alarming, which is very, very a, a significant development. It's a significant development. And uh, and then the United States, after oh, for a while, keeping up our end of the bargain in terms of the negotiation of uh, sharing the data and the notifications about the movement of nuclear weapons, um, strategic weapon systems. Um, the United States has now suspended its participation as a as a countermeasure of saying that if, if Russia resumes, we will too. So that's a very bad situation. And even if the treaty were being fully implemented, it will expire in February of 2026, which means, and this gets to the you know the point you just raised about uh, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, because um, there are no negotiations going on now to replace that treaty. And so if if we don't sort of get to the table with Russia and start talking about not only bringing New START back into full, um, you know, compliance on both sides, but actually what's going to replace it, we could be for the first time in decades in a world where there's absolutely no constraints on U.S. and Russian nuclear weapons. So that's very, very concerning. In terms of the... Um, the speech at the Arms Control Association, what, what the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, he did say that the United States was open to negotiations without preconditions, but I've not seen any evidence. The Russians have said, well, okay, then what's, what's your proposal? You know, right. you know, make a proposal. Mm -hmm. And to my knowledge, I haven't seen any evidence that the United States has actually put a concrete proposal down on the table. Right. And so I don't see a lot of um, evidence that it, that there's going to be movement on either side. The other thing that's really disturbing that's new is, um, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union had really, really bad relations throughout the Cold War. I mean, the, you know, they called it a, we called it a Cold War because and there were proxy wars in different Afghanistan, regions, Afghanistan Vietnam, and Africa yeah. and all different places where we had, you know, sort of a, a, countries that we were friendly with at war with each other. And, you know, the U.S. and Russia weren't directly involved, but, you know, we had interests opposite exactly. each other. And while all that was going on, I mean, they both countries kind of understood their their mutual existential interest in not blowing each other up with nuclear weapons in having agreements where there would be transparency, where there would be limits, where there would be understandings. And I think what's really concerning is just in the last, I don't know, I'd say almost 18 months or so, Russia, President Putin, but also other Russian officials are literally saying now that that kind of compartmentalization is no longer possible. You know, whereas we would say these nuclear risks are so high that even though Russia is doing horrible things in Ukraine, even though they're treating their, you know, there might be human rights issues with them, that we would still, you know, work together to reduce nuclear risk. Um, but Russians are now saying, no, you know, we, we're not willing to isolate that anymore. You know, you're, you know, you're trying to defeat us in Ukraine. You're trying to, you know, do things that aren't in our overall strategic interests, and so therefore we won't work with you on on the nuclear mm -hmm. issues. And so that's really troubling. I mean, it's subjectively not in the Russian interest, I would say, but it's very troubling because it it just means that there until that mindset changes, there will not be any opportunity um, to get back to the table and negotiate. And the UN, uh, UN watchdog on arms control, IAEA, the chief Rafael Grossi himself has highlighted so many times, not just a, a threat of an Armageddon, but also a threat of a nuclear accident in Zaporizhia, which has been a very significant hotspot in, in terms of conventional warfare. Uh, Russia has nonstop targeted uh, the nuclear reactors through conventional means, and it has made significant impact around this, around the whole area. Yeah, this is a whole new thing. And I think this is something that my my colleagues who did the nuclear index uh, are also focused on because um, the international community has really not until now been very concerned about um, the disposition of civil nuclear reactors in, in conflict. Um, there has been concern in the past about like, what if a terrorist threw an air, you know, what if an airplane just 
like crashed into a reactor or what if a terrorist or something actually purposely did that. But um, I don't think people, maybe our imaginations weren't great enough to think that um, in a conflict like the one ongoing in Ukraine, it would actually be used as kind of a leverage and a pressure point. Partly it doesn't make sense because if God forbid there were a significant radiation release there, it would be damaging to troops on both sides. It's close to the Russian border. It's not like the Russians would yes, escape yes. human and environmental. So partly I think we didn't imagine it because it's it's objectively sort of not, doesn't make strategic sense. But here we are actually worried that that something like that could happen to get strategic advantage, or it could just you know, happen inadvertently because, as you say, it's a very um, pivotal region in this war, and it's in the it's literally in the crosshairs. So that's why um, Director General uh, Grossi, as you mentioned from the Atomic Energy International Energy Agency, is working so hard to try to get uh, Russia and Ukraine to agree to a set of ground rules um, that basically will make that a safe a safe zone. Um, you know free from um, the risk of, of uh, you know, hot conflict right around mm -hmm. that, those reactors and the cooling ponds and whatnot. But, you know, he hasn't totally succeeded yet because, frankly, because Russia hasn't been willing. And so, you know, that's very troubling. Uh, and I know that my, my colleagues at NTI who work on material security um, and civil nuclear power are thinking hard about what are the what are the norms and rules and agreements that should be um, developed for the future to make sure this kind of thing, you know, doesn't happen again, or that you're really raising the um, the bar and the norm against doing that? So easily, I mean, we have seen what happened during the Chernobyl disaster, right? And sure. to to yeah. think that some uh, anything that happens in Zaporizhia stays in Zaporizhia, that that's a very that's a very uninformed. Uh, speculation to yeah, me. Yeah, and similarly, like the accident at Fukushima. I mean, that was a result of right. an earthquake, but it's you know that's an example of the kind of um, contamination and destruction of a large landmass that can have happen if, God mm. forbid, you know something happens there. I'm glad we were able to discuss about uh, Russia in in such a depth because my next question is is about even a more not a very alarming. Uh, nuclear threat, but definitely which poses a significant uh, risk in terms of arms control. So recently, Pentagon concluded that China is currently engaged in a nuclear buildup, significantly increasing its uh, nuclear stockpile uh, from 400 to 1,500 warheads by 2035. And here we are talking, I personally calculated a 428% increment in their warhead. So this is a very alarming development. China, who has been also very uh, explicit in terms of uh, nuclear de-risking in Russia-Ukraine conflict, having seen such a move from China is a very alarming development on its own. And the forecast of 1,500 warheads by 2035 poses even a greater risk in the entire Indo-Pacific region. So what are the implications for global nuclear security when we talk about China here? Sure. And, and let me actually first pick up on the one point you just made about it is very significant that President Xi, both publicly and by all accounts privately, made it very clear to President Putin that um, he should not contemplate the use of nuclear weapons in the Ukraine conflict. And that's really important yeah. because I don't, you know, there aren't a lot of um, people or countries that, that are able to influence uh, President Putin's calculations, but I think it's widely thought that, you know, the person probably with the most influence is President Xi. And so, um, you know, that that is a positive thing. Uh, in terms of China's own nuclear forces, yes, you're right, the Pentagon is projecting, um, and our intelligence community is projecting a very significant expansion of China's nuclear force over the next um, 10 to 15 years. It is important to repeat what you said, which is that today China has about 400 nuclear weapons. The United States and Russia each have about 4,000. So that you know that is a very significant difference. China has always had a no first use policy. It's always said its its forces were it was like a minimal deterrent force, um, st strictly to provide um, um, kind of a second strike capacity so that they 
you know, so that they could be protected against suffering a nuclear attack, but that they weren't, um, you know, pursuing any kind of war fighting doctrines. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that they're not projected to have such an expansion, it's very unexpected. And it does suggest that they're changing how they're thinking about the per the role and purpose of nuclear weapons in their national security. Um, it's going to have, it's already having a very big effect here in terms of um, how, especially how the United States government and military is thinking about U.S. nuclear requirements and arms control. I just mentioned that the New START Treaty is about to expire. Um, so obviously the government is thinking about what should a, the next agreement with Russia look like and what numerical limits can we should we have and um and so it's always in the past it's been that the forces of china or any other countries were considered lesser included cases and so that whatever was thought um the united states would need to deter russia that would be enough for any any other contingencies you could think of that's kind of the way it's been for the first time now i think um you know, the military is starting to make, or some are starting to make the case that that isn't the situation. And so people are questioning whether can we live with the new start levels in a new agreement, even if Russia was willing to have another agreement or extend the current one. Um, how much, how much is enough if we're going to, um, if China's force is going to grow? And so, and of course, it's completely unrealistic to think um, that the United States would could ever have the same number as as uh, Russia and China together, because um, Russia will always insist on parity, and so that's just a it's a recipe for a never ending arms race. Um, and so the que you know the question is in this geostrategic environment of tensions with Russia, the erosion of arms control, the projected growth of China's force, mm -hmm. tensions with China, is there's a lot of you know, upward pressure on in terms of having more nuclear weapons here in Russia and China. And so it's a really, really alarming um, development that's, that, that will further complicate the ability to kind of stop that trend and, and go back to limits and reductions, you know, with Russia. And then also just trying the task of trying to bring China into kind of more of an arms control dialogue and eventually negotiations, which they've been historically unwilling to do, largely because their force is so much smaller than that of the United States and Russia. So it's a very complicated picture, but it's a these are negative trends for those of us who think it's very important to continue reducing and ultimately eliminating nuclear weapons, because right now the pressures are going in the opposite direction. Right. And that sort of gives a sense that we are, the world in general is sort of uh, walking back from whatever gains it made from the cold, post Cold War era and the uh, years of uh, peace that ended, that was existent between some of the superpowers in the world. Exactly. So moving towards uh, some good development, a positive development in terms of arms control, because I'm sure about these very serious conversations about nuclear proliferation and warheads, our audience would love to listen to some good new developments. So there has been a recent development. Uh, I was in a conference with uh, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, the present undersecretary for uh, arms control and international security. So she mentioned her department was robustly involved in destroying the last stockpile of U of chemical weapons in the United States. How big of an achievement is it? Because in the modern day, we have seen in Syria what happened in Ghouta, what in during President Obama's administration, uh, Bashar al-Assad allegedly used chemical weapons on his own people. And we saw what the devastating effects of chemical weapons has also been in the Middle East in the Gulf War before that. So... Does the world still face any major risk from chemical or biological weapons? How big an achievement for United States or and the international community it is that United States has now uh, destroyed the last stockpile of its chemical weapon? Well, okay, those are a lot of questions. First of all, it is a it is a huge um, achievement and significant that the United States has destroyed its chemical stockpile. Um, 
there is almost universal adherence to the Chemical Weapons Convention, which bans the possession and stockpiling of, of chemical weapons. Um, I think there's only a couple of states that, that haven't signed and ratified the treaty. Um, by far, the biggest stockpiles um, that were owned were the United States and the Soviet Union. I mean, it was, I mean, massive quantities. And the treaty, it was uh, negotiated by, I think, in the Nixon administration. So it's a treaty, you know, that dates back to the 70s. I, I think it wasn't, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it didn't come into four. I guess it was started back then. I guess it was actually finalized in the Clinton administration. And, um, you know, so it probably didn't come into force until the 90s. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what year. Right. Um, and the treaty actually required the of the signatories complete elimination by by the year 2012. And then it had a an extension period of five to 2017. And the Russians needed the extension period and finally got rid of theirs just that year, just in time. The United States didn't even make that. We didn't, we, we finally just finished it now. And it wasn't for a lack of will. I mean, it cost $42 billion or something like that. It costs, it turned out to be extremely technically complex to get rid of these dangerous um, chemicals. And some were done by some kind of dilution method and others um, were done by, um, by a different method. Um, and then of course, all the shells that they were, they were stored and had to be destroyed. But um, so the, there are a couple of points here. I mean, one is that almost every country in the world agreed to get rid of them because they were they were horrific. We saw how they were used in World War I. Um, and they didn't really feel that they had much strategic advantage on the battlefield. They were just horrible, horrible, you know, weapons in terms of their, you know, their um, impact, their humanitarian consequences. Um, but when you create these weapons of mass destruction, be them nuclear or chemical, and we'll talk about biological too, the point is it, it's extremely expensive to develop them and maintain them. And it's also extremely expensive to you know, to, to try to get rid of them. And, or, or in the case of the nuclear materials, and we talked about plutonium stocks before, to kind of babysit, you know, these materials that are very dangerous if they get into the wrong hands, they're dangerous for people who work with them, they're dangerous to the environment. So, I mean, there's a lot of um, negative hazards associated with, with these weapons of mass destruction. Um, and it should be a good reminder to countries who, who haven't gone down this path not to. Um, in terms of the um, how much chemical weapons are still a risk, I mean, I think there's a, you know, yes, this, this Syria thing was, was horrible. It's interesting that the United States and Russia actually worked together then to eliminate uh, the bulk of Syria's uh, stockpile. Yes. Um, that's the other thing. There's a really a, a long U.S. Russian tradition of working together on proliferation with risks elsewhere, including Iran. Um, so, and I, you know, I think there's a couple concerns about a couple of countries and programs. Um, and biological weapons is 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 also a challenge. Um, there's a unit. There's a, a biological weapons convention. It doesn't have the same um, verification you know, methods, it really doesn't have a verification regime associated with it the way the chemical weapons did. And of course, now there's concerns about new advances in technology, AI, synthetic biology, mm -hmm. all of that, which can give the means for both state actors, but also non-state actors to um, develop really dangerous um, systems. So there, there's always concerns. And I, I know there was just a Pentagon report about um, biological weapons defense and some questions about, you know, whether Russia and or Iran have such programs, North Korea, um, whether China might be interested in this. So, you know, there's always going to be concerns about nefarious uses of, of what is essentially dual capable technology that has um, a lot of appropriate and positive um, applications in in um, you know science and medicine, but could be used for nefarious purposes. So um, it's just a continuing challenge. And um, for all of these issues, whether it's 
biochem, bio, nuclear, um, the intersection with new technology um, just makes it all the more complicated and risky. Yes, I mean, it's it's great how uh, technology has been able to transform the threat, threat assessment of all sorts of weapons across spectrum. So towards the end of the conversation, I mean, we can definitely go on and on and discuss North Korea, Iran, and whatnot. So uh, towards the end, I want to just zoom out a little bit and circle back to Oppenheimer. That movie has clearly shown the kind of devastation and destruction uh, nuclear weapons can cause to humankind. And today, when we are looking at these developments that you spoke about, about Russia walking away from New START, China building up its nuclear arsenal, uh, there is a globe and Zaporizhia being targeted, uh, increased risk of nuclear war, nuclear accident. What the future of arms control is actually looking like today? Well, so I'm an optimist. There are there are many people who will tell you that arms control is dead and you can never have another agreement ratified by the Senate. And um, but you know, I just feel that there's no alternative to coming in arms control, I would use it in the broadest sense, but there's no alternative to um carving out some um some systems of restraint norms of acceptable behavior um, that are in the mutual interest of, of all countries, because I actually don't think the use of nuclear weapons will benefit any country. Um, we need to kind of, as societies, understand both the benefits and the risks of, of technologies like AI. And so, you know, there, and cyber is another example, cyber nuclear risks. And so I think I just have to believe in the um, capacity of humankind to act in its own interests. Um, and even as states uh, have adversarial positions, have competing interests, that there's some common interest in self-preservation that will cause them, as we have for the last 60 or 70 years, to manage these most deadliest of technologies like nuclear um, to prevent their their being used. So I am going to, I don't know, stay in the optimist camp and believe that even though right now the prospects are bad, um, that that something will happen, just like the Cuban Missile Crisis, something will will cause leaders in Russia, others to decide that they need to cooperate um, to prevent catastrophe. Actually, you're muted. I can't hear you. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. So, but I'm glad we were able to conclude on this note of optimism. I'm I'm very sure and I have complete faith in your words. And I'm sure our viewers would definitely take away interesting points from your from your uh, argument today. And that gives, that draws a very uh, hopeful picture for the future in terms of uh, state heads talking to each other and working together in de-risking and uh, reducing whatever threats our society and the mankind at large faces from nuclear weapons and any other weapons of mass destruction. Well, Mrs. Rustin, it has been a pleasure talking to you. And I'm definitely sure uh, that our viewers will get to learn a lot from this conversation. So thank you very much. And we were very happy. To, we were very happy to host you. And we hope that we'll have you in future as well. Well, Sid, thank you so much. And I'm putting my faith in uh, your viewers and the next generation to work on these issues and do a better job than my generation has done. <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am. Take care. Okay.